You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I see we have uh, Jim calling in, so I'm going to bring him right on, and I want to welcome back to the program as he joins us each and every week, James S. Robbins. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you? Hey, I'm doing all right. How are you guys doing? Well, it's funny. I, I've been talking a lot about economics today uh, and a little bit about the immigration bill and and the stock market and some of the things that, you know, really just domestic policy that's causing a lot of our problems. And, you know, it's really interesting, Jim. I don't know if you picked up on this, but in Europe, where we had all these countries that had significant issues, whether it be Greece or Italy or Spain or Portugal – Spain and Portugal right now are they're, are seeing their exports increasing and things going well because they the drastic steps to correct their problems. And I'm, I'm looking at this saying, we should be doing that here. <laughs> uh, it's pretty sad if Spain and Portugal become our models, you know, if we're in that much <laughs> trouble. And nothing against Spain or Portugal. I know they, the thing is they had issues and they fixed them, which is good. Uh, it's just sad that we have reached that point where we have those kind of problems. I mean, you know, next we'll be looking to Greece for sound financial uh, advice. Yeah, well, the interesting thing is that there, the Wall Street Journal yesterday happened to have a lot of really good articles, and, and you know, some of it was on Ukraine, which we'll, we'll get into. But they were talking about the uh, UK, who, who has uh, deficits in their current account and their uh, you know, fiscal budget. So they, they're like double negative. And they're talking about that they're in the same company as Ukraine and Turkey and South Africa and Colombia. And, you know, we used to think of, you know, Great Britain as, you know, not that long ago, they were an empire still. And the emerging markets are having trouble. And, you know, I'm sitting here arguing for weeks that we need to be more involved in pushing Ukraine into the Euro, uh, European Union because uh, I think that that's good for our future. And they finally are getting involved and saying, hey, let's come up with aid packages to help Ukraine and replace what Russia was offering. And I think that's smart. But, you know, I think all this stuff, we got to, you know, have a, a more comprehensive plan to deal with this, you know, if we're going to be global, uh, to deal with global economics. Yeah, but we're not going to have a comprehensive plan because the people <laughs> in charge can't get that together. There's no way that they'll be able to fix it. Uh, they will, you know, try to put together an economic plan that will insist on things like uh, fixes for global warming and, you know, all this kind of junk. They they won't focus on the things that are really necessary, like making U.S. business tax laws uh, correspond to the rest of the world, you know, lower them so that we become more competitive or rationalize our uh, the regulatory scheme. Uh, mm -hmm. to make things more competitive. Yeah, you know, like those types of things, really the important things, the the legal and regulatory infrastructure that desperately needs revamping. Instead, they'll focus on stuff like, you know, the climate or some uh, human rights issue that no one's ever heard of or, you know, something obscure that, that is really, really, really important to a very, very small group of elitists but has nothing to do with developing the economy. So, Yes, we, it would be great if we could have some kind of comprehensive plan to make the U.S. more competitive and mesh better with the world, but you know, the people we have in charge right now, they're just not up to the task. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, Jim, I'm out there three days a week now shoveling inches and inches and inches of snow, saying to myself, damn, I hate this global warming. I'm really getting tired of it being 10 degrees and my, my hand sticking to my car door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty funny. We had a we had a, an Arctic owl in uh, Washington the other day. It had flown down from the from the tundra somewhere to hunt in Washington. I thought, okay, that's. I mean, that's this is such a great symbol, you know, when the the creatures of the Arctic come all the way to Washington. Uh, then you really have to wonder what the heck, you know, are we, is, is investing millions of dollars in windmills really helping us out? I just have to wonder. <laughs> no, not really. I, what, I, I forgot the exact statistic, but it was like less than 2% of all of our energy is being uh, produced by wind and solar. 
And if if it's not exactly two percent, it's pretty darn close. And I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, think of all the windmills and solar panels all over the place. If we had to get up to like even like fifty percent, the whole globe would have to be covered with this stuff. I mean, it's like it's an impossibility. Yeah, the technology just isn't there yet, and throwing money at it isn't what's going to make it appear. I mean, we've seen that because the wrong people get the money and they don't know what to do with it and. There's nothing in history that tells us that great technological breakthroughs come through multi-million dollar federal grants to cronies. You know, that's just not the way to the future. So I hope that some kid at MIT invents the super windmill that's the size of a, you know, a little fan on your desk but can power a whole city. You know, I, I hope that they develop solar panels that are thin as paper, can fit on everything, and generate enough stuff to keep your house going forever. That would be fine. But until that time, uh, maybe we should concentrate on exploiting to the hilt all the things that we have that we know that work and make them cheaper so the economy can grow and that uh, people can have more discretionary income that they're not putting it into their uh, home heating or their gas tank or something like that. Yeah, yeah Jim, he, here's more of a historical question for you because as I, I you know, re- we spend so much time reviewing the news cycle, you know, not only here but around the world, and we follow so many stories. And when when you're looking at, say, what's going on with the elections in Thailand or e- even South Africa, all the things going on in the Middle East, other parts of Asia and South America and Central America, and even here, do you recall a time where there were so many governments that could go one way or another – where it, it, it seems to me that there's so much upheaval and so much uh, unsurety, if you if you will, in the direction of where that the the world is headed. I, I mean, does it seem like that to you? Because uh, you know, I know we had like you know you had the Vietnam War going on and you had other things, but it seems to me it's like everywhere you turn there's something crazy going on, and you just don't know is it going to be a good result or a bad result. Well, it does seem strange. I think that folks are wondering where the economies are going to go around the world, how much debt Mm -hmm. can be assumed by how many governments before it all finally crumbles. I think the Europeans, in dealing with the the crisis in the Eurozone, uh, assumed a lot of debt and are just trying to ignore it. I think that's definitely the case with the United States. We are completely ignoring our debt problems and just hoping that they'll go away you know, let the the Fed prime the pump, which is kind of shady accounting practice to try to get rid of debt. Uh, China, which holds a lot of debt, doesn't want to rock the boat because they know that if it defaults, they get hurt the worst. So they're the least of the people who want to cause a problem right now. And the same with Japan, because they hold a lot of debt. Yeah. So One other thing there, too. They also know that as our interest rate goes up, they're going to get paid more. Oh yeah, yeah. Cause as, and, as we roll over debt in future years, because you know we we roll over debt. That's what ha- not all of it at the same time, but as we roll over debt, it gets rolled into whatever the new interest rate is. So if we if we have to replace a hundred billion of current debt that came due with a hundred billion of new debt purchased from China or Russia or from some, whoever, we're going to pay higher interest rates at some point, and they'll be oh, more sure. than happy. <laughs> So long as we can make our minimum payments, then everybody's happy. But, you know, you have a president who thinks that raising the debt limit doesn't actually increase our debt. So that's, again, another example of his grasp of economics. There are some good news things out there. I mean, the uh, movements in the energy sector, we are just talking about that, but uh, the uh, increased production in the United States and North America generally, uh, which is keeping – oil prices kind of suppressed and keeping gas prices down and the fact that the United States in coming years may once again be an oil exporting nation. I think things like that are really positive developments. Not that you'll hear about that because the, you know, in Washington and in the press, they don't, they don't like to talk about things like that because they seem to support, you know, the other side, the, you know, fossil fuel burning, uh, pro-capitalist, pro-growth, you know, kind of old, good old-time America back when we were strong and productive. And, uh, you know, they don't want to hear about that. So there are some good news things going on, but I think the bad news really outweighs the good, and that's what creates that uncertainty. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I would say this, and, and I've been arguing for, you know, just, let's just have a free for all in natural gas and oil, because frankly, I think we can create millions of jobs overnight and increase mass amounts of revenue to the federal government and probably even lower tax rates because it's such an amazing story. I don't I just don't we're like wasting the opportunity because we right now we should be paying we should be paying down our deficits right now. We should be able to do that, but we we're like no, we're not going to do it because it makes too much sense. And so I I think you're absolutely right. That is that is a, a great story and we're not exploiting it. Oh no, because the people in charge they're they're not strategic thinkers and even if they were they wouldn't come up with that strategy because they just don't want to focus on that. They they're trying to figure out how to grow algae to run our ships at sea, you know, things like that. Uh these kind of uh mystery energies that cost 20 times what proven energies, you know, energy uh sources cost. So they're they're busy trying to work out that problem. Uh, meanwhile, uh, private industry is figuring it out. I mean, thank God that the administration, which I mean, if you go back to the early years of the Obama administration, they were looking for a way to get rid of fracking, you know, looking for a way. It wasn't just Keystone. It was beyond that. They wanted to, like, kill the whole thing. But I think that the the growth and the job growth that came out of it, you know, it's coming out of North Dakota and other places, and I just heard, like, Eastern Ohio – uh, is no longer depressed now because there's all kinds of money there from fracking. Suddenly, the Akron Canton area, a friend of mine was just there saying it's a, it's a boom town now. And I think the administration realized, wow, this is the only good news story in the whole country, and maybe we could just ignore it. We won't claim credit for it, but we'll just kind of ignore it, but reap the benefits from it. Because if they had successfully killed off fracking, then there'd be nothing in this economy. There'd be no good news story to point to. Right. And, and, you know, for, for Bill de Blasio, the new mayor of New York City, you know, if he really wanted to provide free K through uh, kindergarten education to everybody, all he has to do is go, hey, Cuomo, let's allow the fracking in New York State because we'll have it paid for and we without raising taxes. And everybody wins. And, and but God, by the way, we'll, you know, reduce unemployment at the same time. <laughs> but they, they just yeah. won't. They might have to let in some of the people that uh, Governor Cuomo said aren't welcome in New York, though, uh, <laughs> and they might not like that. Uh, so, And uh, by the way, I was really interested in the story that was linked on the Drudge Report today about Donald Trump uh, looking at running for governor of New York. Now, that would be something. I mean, talk about a guy who could get it done. I'd like to see that guy go as far as he could in politics uh, if he was just going to fix this country because – we're we're a state now where it's beyond ideology. It's beyond right and left. We need somebody who's going to fix the place. It's fundamentally broken. Hillary Clinton yeah. is not that person. She doesn't know anything. Uh, she is just a functionary. She will get nothing done. She has no experience, and she would just be a disaster for our country. At best, we would coast. At worst, we would just go over a cliff. But with someone like Trump... And it doesn't have to be him, but just for example, just someone who can fix things, like just get it going again. That's the kind of guy that we need. So if he's gonna if he's gonna fix New York, then you know more power to him. Uh, I agree with you there, uh, Jim. In the last few minutes we have, could we go to the Middle East and and Afghanistan, uh, which I suppose is you know uh, here's a problem I'm having. It seems to me, and we, we've discussed this a lot, I know, but it seems to me that we've almost lost the complete conversation with what's going on in Afghanistan. The Taliban is becoming even more influential. Uh, when you look at Iraq, you see the uh, al-Qaeda issue. You see Iran taking over, uh, you know, portions at least. And then you look at what they're trying to do to Israel with the peace agreement that we've discussed numerous times. Uh, do you see the possibility of the, the – the, and I consider this to be a like a miraculous change, what happened in Egypt. Is it possible for something to happen in any of these areas that will change the mind of this administration to to change course? Or are they going to continue – to really put Israel in a position that 
you know, you wouldn't wish on your enemies, really. No, they won't change course. Uh, John Kerry doesn't have your point of view. I mean, the things that you enunciated, he's he's not going to do because he doesn't believe in them, and he thinks that he can make peace there on his terms, which are the wrong terms, and it won't work. Plus, the administration has doggedly stuck to its strategy, if you can call it that, in the Middle East for five years, facing failure after failure. So if they were going to change, they would have changed course by now. I think the best thing that they can do is just do nothing because every time they do something, it turns out wrong. Like, you know, in Syria, for example. In the end, we wound up doing nothing, and it was a big humiliation after that line in the sand business. But you know what? If he had done more, if he had actually tried to enforce that line in the sand, it would have been a fiasco. We'd be talking about that fiasco right now. So I think nothing is about the best that this current administration can do based on the people that they have and the talent available uh, if they don't screw it up, that's better than them doing something and then it being a complete catastrophe. And I, of course, do not hold out the hope that they would do something that would work. <laughs> that just isn't going to happen. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, you, we both mentioned Syria, but some recent reporting is talking about the actual raising of neighborhoods or towns or, you know, villages who – even any kind of support was coming again, you know, uh, uh, of the rebel support where uh, Assad's government just sent in the military and had, they've been leveling areas. I mean, indiscriminately killing and, and wiping out areas to the point where they would go to the next neighborhood and say, if we see a single shell or anything come from here, we're doing the same thing what we did in that town. I mean, and what really bugs me is we have, you know, Samantha Powers in particular in her position who has been so outspoken against genocide and, and a lot of these issues to me I haven't heard a peep out of her and I'm actually surprised because you know regardless of what we should actually be doing in Syria you have to I mean I mean it's sick what's going on and I think that's why Saudi Arabia was really so upset with us because they see hundreds you know what it's got to be 150,000 people at this point or pretty close of of, of civilians just <laughs> killed I mean, it's just, it, it's upsetting, you know, because it's it. This is beyond rebels fighting, you know, Assad's troops. These are just innocent people, just like we saw happening, um, you know, in, in uh, Serbia, and, and all that going on. That was equally disturbing. Well, when Samantha Powers was the architect of the justification for intervening in Libya back a mm -hmm. few years ago, uh, like five thousand people had been died. Had, had been killed in their factional struggles, and they were afraid. That, they said, if we don't take action, maybe 10,000 will die, and this is a human rights tragedy, and we can't afford not to act. And, you know, that the world would judge us, and, and this kind of language. And that, that was the justification for going into Libya. So how far have we passed that in Syria? I mean, this is why you don't hear from her, because if she can, if she says anything, she'd have to back off of her previous pronouncements about um, you know, justification for preemptive humanitarian intervention. Well, it's mm -hmm. not even preemptive anymore in Syria. It's just a flat-out human rights nightmare. But the administration doesn't know what to do or they can't do anything or who knows what. It's too late to take action. Who knows? Uh, are they hypocrites? Yes. Are they failed? Yes. I mean, <laughs> the bad news just keeps on coming. And I don't have a solution now for Syria. If he asked me a couple years ago, yeah, maybe then, maybe before all of the liberal moderates were killed off, you know, by al-Qaeda and foreign interventionists and people like that and homegrown radicals in Syria. Yeah, maybe maybe a couple of years ago we had a chance to intervene, backing the right people and you know giving them the same kind of support we gave the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan that ran the Taliban out of town with air support, intelligence support and things like that. You know, no boots on the ground, but maybe some paramilitaries. That would have worked. But it wouldn't work today because who are you going to do that for? Are you going to go in there and support the rebellion? The rebellion is Al-Qaeda now. They're our enemy. So we've got Al-Qaeda fighting you know, the Assad regime. You've got innocent civilians in the middle getting slaughtered. And, that, I mean, that's the real tragedy. But if you're going to go in and try to stop that, 
who are you going to support? The regime who hates us or Al-Qaeda who hates us worse? You know, if it were just those guys fighting and there were no civilians or refugees in the middle or Kurds or folks like that, Christians, I would say let them go at each other. <laughs> you know, Al-Qaeda wants to go after Assad and vice versa. Great. Let them kill each other. That would be fantastic. It, Unfortunately, you know, it's not that clean. No, it's not. It, it, this this is what was very interesting, and I've heard all I've read all kinds of stuff over the last few weeks, and and some of it like you don't know what's what's true and what's not, but it's certainly suspicious because Al Qaeda has launched attacks on you know some of the rebel leaders, and there there have been assassinations of, of all different types, and you got to wonder, are, is there some cooperation between Al Qaeda? And, and between uh, Assad at, at any rate. But anyway, Jeremy, we've got about 30 seconds left, so I'll let you finish with that. Well, it, the same thing happened in Iraq because you have rebel leaders who don't want to play ball with al-Qaeda. They just kill you. I mean, if you're a moderate rebel, so far as al-Qaeda is concerned, you're, just, you're still the enemy, so they just kill them off. That's, that's the way struggles work in that part of the world, and it'll never change. Sounds good. Anyway, Jim, thank you as always, and we'll see you next week. Okay, see ya. James S. Robbins, folks, uh, great as always.